ancient Greek philosophers such as Aristotle thought that the universe was infinitely old and had no beginning, therefore. During late antiquity in the medieval period, many theistic thinkers broke with this tradition on theological and philosophical grounds. For example, the 12th century medieval Muslim philosopher Al-Ghazi argued that the idea of an actual infinity, or actual infinities, entailed various absurdities when you thought carefully about it, such that the past must be finite in order to make sense. And the universe must therefore have had a beginning. Al-Ghazi made the uh, finitude of the past a premise, a truth claim, in an argument for God that's today known as the Kalam cosmological argument, being popularized, uh, of course, particularly by the work of William Lane Craig from the States. He did uh, his first uh, PhD uh, on this area. Al-Ghazi said, that, look, every being which begins has a cause for its beginning. Now, the world is a being which begins because it has a finite past. Therefore, it, the world, possesses a cause for its beginning. So there's something outside the universe that caused it. Belief in a universe with no beginning became fashionable again in the 18th century, due in part to the influence of German philosopher Immanuel Kant. As philosopher of science Stephen Mayer observes, few physicists or astronomers at the beginning of the 20th century doubted the infinite age of the universe. In 1927, Belgian cosmologist and Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre, combined Einstein's theory of gravity with the observation of a Doppler shift in the light from distant galaxies um, to formulate what would come to be known later as a, the Big Bang theory of the origins of the universe. Now, Big Bang cosmology has developed a lot over time since then, but the basic picture of a universe with a beginning a finite time ago has been the scientific consensus since the, at least since the 1965 discovery of the cosmic background radiation left over from the, from the Big Bang, which various satellites have mapped in more detail uh, over time. Uh, to quote from uh, an article in New Scientist magazine, the Big Bang is now part of the furniture of modern cosmology. It now seems certain that the universe did have a beginning. Without an escape clause, physicists and philosophers must finally answer a problem that's been nagging at them for the best part of 50 years. How do you get a universe, complete with the laws of physics, out of nothing? Or indeed, do you? <laughs> Big Bang cosmology, you see, describes the evolution, the change over time of the universe from a very hot, dense state, a finite time ago, but it does not say anything about what brought the universe into existence. Big Bang cosmology offers a description of the cosmic past as being finite. It doesn't offer an explanation of that finite cosmic past. That's a mistake. I often found that, that teenage school kids that I used to work with thought that Big Bang cosmology conflicted with belief in God. And so I don't believe in God because the Big Bang explains where we all came from. And so no, the Big Bang's not an, not an explanation, it's a description. It's a description that itself may or may not need an explanation. That's a kind of philosophical question here. So as atheist philosopher Bradley Monton, who we quoted before, says, if the universe had a beginning, then that lends support to the Kalam cosmological argument. And this is what Bill Craig did um, in, the, in the 70s, I think it was, because Big Bang cosmology was coming to a main line, and he recognized there's this ancient philosophical tradition of arguing about the finitude of the past, uh, but now we have, seem to have an empirical scientific argument for the same thing. That would be in invest interesting to investigate that, that overlap there. So atheist Nobel laureate in physics, Steven Weinberg, says uh, the Big Bang theory is as certain as anything in science. I suppose nothing in science is ever mathematically certain, 
like 2 plus 2 equals 4, but it's the kind of certainty that simply makes it not worthwhile considering alternatives. Atheist cosmologist Alexander Vlenkin uh, said, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. He says, the answer to the question, did the universe have a beginning, is it probably did. We have no viable models of an eternal universe. So we can make that our first premise, truth claim, in an argument like al Ghazi, but I'm going to put, you know, here's how I'd put a spin on it. Premise one, there was probably a first physical event. Premise two, every physical event has at least one cause outside of itself. Now, if those two are claims are both true, it, it, it follows that you can draw a certain conclusion from here. But I want to argue for premise two, because Big Bang cosmology would do for premise one, but premise two, why believe this? Well, one, anything contingent or dependent has at least one cause outside of itself. Physical events are, by their nature, contingent. They don't have to exist. And dependent. Therefore, every physical event has at least one cause outside of itself, which is our premise two. So if we got one and two, we can draw this conclusion. Therefore, there was probably a first physical event with at least one cause outside of itself. Now we can push a little bit further, if we like. We can change that conclusion into, just rename that premise three, add a new premise, we like chaining our little synergistic units of argumentation together, like a daisy chain. Premise four, any, any first physical event with at least one cause outside of itself must have a non-physical cause, right? Because causes are either physical or not. There's not really any other option there, right? From which it would follow, new conclusion follows, Therefore, there was probably a first physical event with a non-physical cause. So if this is correct, that sinks naturalism and materialism as a worldview, what materialism and, and something outside of the universe that caused the universe, and this would be very uncomfortable for a naturalistic worldview, uh, and you can start asking questions about, well, what kind of thing would that have to, uh, to be? Um, at the very least, you're getting close to a chunk of what theism believes. Um, let me give you this kind of more concrete illustration, which I like doing. Suppose I ask you to loan me a book, uh, and you say, oh, I don't have a copy right now, but I'll ask my friend to lend me his copy, and then I'll lend it to you. But suppose your friend says the same thing to you, and so on, and so on, and so on. Two things are clear. First, if this process of asking to borrow the book, this is an analogy for being caused to exist, getting existence from something outside of yourself. If the process of asking to borrow the book goes on ad infinitum, I'll never get the book. Second, if I get the book, then the process that led to me getting it can't have gone on ad infinitum. Somewhere down the line of requests to borrow the book, to get existence, <laughs> as it were, someone had the book without having to borrow it. There's got to be something that just has existence and the ability to give it without having to get that from anywhere. Likewise, argues philosopher Richard Pertill, Consider any contingent or dependent reality, such as a physical event, including any first physical event. It says the same two principles apply. If the process of everything getting its existence from something else went on to infinity, then the thing in question would never have existence. And if the thing has existence, then the process hasn't gone on to infinity. There was something that had existence without having to receive it from something else. And you combine that with the argument we've already given, and you're, you're increasing the, the kind of photo fit description of 
the culprit, as it were. So as philosopher Dallas Willard famously argued in a famous paper of his, said the dependent character of all physical states, together with the completeness, the completeness of the series of dependencies that underlie the existence of any given physical state, including the first one, logically implies at least one self-existent and therefore non-physical state of being. But we've already argued in the, the Kalam argument there that the, the physical universe probably has a non-physical cause outside of itself. And so we can say a non-physical cause, again, on pain of infinite regress, a non-physical cause that is self-existent in, in that sense. This is at least part of the puzzle of existence. A self-existent, i.e. independent, and therefore non-physical state of being that caused the existence of the physical universe. It's a good slice of what theists mean by God. But you see how we've gone from a, a, a premise, a truth claim, that's warranted by a scientific theory, and combined that with philosophical claims about the nature of causality and so on, to lead to a philosophical conclusion. So again, it's showing you this idea you can just science and theology and never the twain shall meet. Actually, you can have you can have premises and philosophical arguments for God where some of the bits of that argument, some of the premises of those arguments can be warranted by scientific theories. Where we'll turn from the Big Bang and relationship to the Kalam cosmological argument and look at, at what's called cosmic fine tuning. Beginning with atheist astrophysicist Fred Hoyle's 1953 prediction of a finely tuned resonance state in the carbon-12 atomic nucleus, which was later verified and is now known as the Hoyle state, Scientists have come to recognize that the existence of organic life, and most especially the existence of what philosopher Robin Collins calls embodied conscious agents, ECAs, uh, like ourselves, that is, observer, observers able to significantly interact with each other and to develop scientific technology and discover the universe, that the existence of life like that in particular as well depends upon a staggering degree of cosmic and, indeed, more local planetary, but I won't go into that, uh, fine tuning. William Lane Craig gives a good explanation of this. He says, scientists have discovered that the existence of intelligent life, ECAs, uh, depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions given in the Big Bang itself, in addition to the, the laws of physics themselves, Fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain so-called constants, like the constant that represents the force of gravity. The laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of different values for these constants. Second, there are initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy or the balance between matter and antimatter in the universe right at the beginning. So you have initial conditions and then regular patterns of way things, way things behave that act upon from the basis of those con initial conditions. Craig says these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily what a great word, extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. A change in the strength of the atomic weak force by only one part in 10 to the power of 100 would have prevented a life-permitting universe. Now, to give you some kind of comparison for these numbers where we, we write these numbers, they're so long, that it's really difficult or impossible literally, to write them out longhand, even if like you used every atom in the universe as somewhere to write a zero in the number. <laughs> These are really big numbers. So it's generally said that the, the number of fundamental particles or whatever in the universe is around about 10 to the power of 80. 
All right. A change in just one of these values in the fine tuning, the atomic weak force of by one part in 10 to the 100, would have prevented a life permitting universe. The cosmological constant, which drives the, the inflation, the expansion of the universe, is fine tuned to around one part in 10 to the 120. Uh, and because these, these multiples, you're, you're not doing adding, you're doing multiplying. It's the number of times you're multiplying the number. So these, these numbers go up kind of exponentially, as it were. The odds of the Big Bang's low entropy condition existing by chance are of the order of 1 out of 10 to the 10 to the 123. These numbers are not astronomical in their size. They are way beyond astronomical in their size, where saying something is astronomically big is like saying it's as big as the number of stars in the observable universe or something like that. Way beyond that. Craig observes that to detect design, he says, in addition to high improbability, we can call that complexity, there also needs to be a conformity, a match, to an independently given pattern. When these two elements are present, we have what's called specified complexity, or sometimes called complex specified information, which is the tip-off to intelligent design. Um, so this thing about the, the independent pattern, it's not enough just to see an arrow on a wall in the center of a target. You know, maybe someone went, I'm going to shoot an arrow, and then I'm going to get a paint pot, go up to my arrow, and draw a target around it. <laughs> it's got to be an independently given. You can't just read off the pattern from observing the event itself. So it's got to be a non-ad hoc pattern. But that combination of high enough, high enough complexity with independent pattern matching is a tip-off to intelligent design. Um, concrete example. So Craig, he says, thus, in a poker game, any deal of the cards is equally and highly improbable. So you get one deal of cards of that length, one specific deal, out of all of the possible deals, combinations of cards of that length. So it's highly improbable, any hand of cards that you get. But if you find that every time a certain player deals, he gets all four aces, which would be a winning hand in poker. I, I love the implicit joke here. You can bet this is not the result of chance, but of design. And if you raised your suspicions with this particular poker player, he couldn't rationally allay your suspicions by saying, hey, any hand of cards that I get is equally as improbable as any other. It's just as improbable as your hand. I say, but you keep getting all four aces every time that you're the person who deals the cards. And he says, yeah, I'm lucky. <laughs> no, 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 no. I am going to be highly suspicious of them. Uh, so a uh, philosopher uh, from Norway, Espin Lukhammer, uh, says that, uh, quotes a cosmologist called Luke Barnes, who's calculated using what he says are conservative numbers, the combined odds of this fine-tuning, using conservative numbers, and he says the combined odds are that a life-permitting universe should exist on the assumption of naturalism, on the assumption that there's no intention or design behind it is less than one part out of 10 to the 136. A phys physicist called Lee Smolin has calculated that the odds of a life-compatible numbers you know, coming up in the casino of life, as it were, uh, are around one chance in 10 to the 229. As Stephen Hawking uh, said with co-author Leonard Mlodnow in their book, The Grand Design, the initial state of the universe had to be set up in a very special and 
highly improbable way. Very special pattern and highly improbable, with specified complexity. So it seems like the fine tuning of the universe, discovered since the 1950s, exhibits this kind of pattern, this specified complexity. So if we have that as our first premise, that the universe does exhibit specified complexity, and combine that with premise two, things exhibiting specified complexity are probably designed, well, of course, that spits out the conclusion that the fine tuning of the universe was probably designed, right? Now, the, the main, there are, there are objections, of course, and the main objection, which I'll focus on, is to premise one here, is the many universes objection. Um, it's a bit like saying, yeah, I keep getting all four aces when I deal, but maybe there are a really large number of poker games going on, such that it becomes less surprising that someone is lucky. Okay? I give myself more rolls of the dice or whatever. The many universe objection denies premise one of this argument by hypothesizing the existence of an infinite or at least a very large multiverse of differently tuned universes with different starting conditions, such that but it becomes more probable that by chance one of them would happen to hit that specification of, of being compatible with life. So it's saying, it, okay, it's specified, but it's not complex enough, not unlikely enough, to trigger a design inference. So it's denying the, the complexity bit of premise one. So Richard Dawkins suggests that there are billions of universes having different laws and constants. We could only find ourselves in one of the minority of universes whose laws and constants happen to be propitious or to allow our evolution. So that's his rejoinder. Now, I think there are at least eight problems with the multiverse hypothesis, which together form a cumulative argument against it. And it's speculative, complex, empirically unverifiable and unverified. Uh, that it's ad hoc, that it's insufficient to explain away the data, that it's question begging, that it undermines the practice of science, and that it is strongly disconfirmed by evidence. I will go through these one by one, don't worry. <laughs> so, um, speculative, um, astrophysicist Rodney Holder points out that the physics associated with multiverse theories is speculative, to say the least, especially when it comes to, to string theory. It's a very complex hypothesis. You would need a lot of differently tuned, and why are they differently tuned? Universes to improve the odds of having a single life-permitting universe. And why, why isn't whatever produces these multiverses like a photocopying machine, spitting out lots of identical universes that are incompatible with life? Why, does it, why are there lots of universes that have different constants and quantities, as, as Dawkins says? That's a kind of a question left, left hanging here. It's a lot of complexity to posit just to avoid what seems to be the common sense inference. So British philosopher Richard Swinburne, for example, says to, to postulate a trillion, trillion other universes rather than one God in order to explain the orderliness of the universe seems like the height of irrationality. Now, any, any, at least any scientific multiverse hypothesis has to posit some sort of universe-generating mechanism. Uh, and perhaps it's this mechanism that should, and not its results, that should be compared with the God hypothesis in that case. But a good essay in this book, uh, New Theist Response to the New Atheist, uh, by uh, Logan Paul Gage, he points out that simplicity in explanation is a secondary virtue, not an automatic trump card. Um, more complex theories should not be automatically discounted. There are other explanatory virtues involved in deciding what the best explanation is, he's saying. He says, even if there is something of a, a, a discount on new tokens of old kinds, so you say, well, at least we know that there can be universes when we're invoking multiple other universes to explain this data. There's something of a discount on new tokens of old kinds of thing. It isn't a blank check. Uh, one new kind of thing in an explanation uh, 
would be more than offset by infinitely many new tokens of an old kind, for example. And Logan argues that, um, Logan Gage argues that theism is simpler than naturalism in terms of the number of fundamental entities postulated in theory. The number of fundamental entities postulated in the theories, in the theories is simpler on theism. Three empirically unverified and unverifiable. So Adam Frank, who's a professor of astrophysics at the University of Rochester. This is from a very recent article, February 2022, from Big Think. Um, he said that there is no empirically grounded scientific reason to believe there's such a thing as a multiverse of parallel realities. Indeed, cosmologist George Ellis says that the existence of multiverses is neither established nor scientifically establishable. Fourthly, it's, it's ad hoc. Um, we've got premise one here. Dawkins um, is really saying, if there were enough different universes, then the specified structure of our universe wouldn't be complex or unlikely enough to justify a design inference. That's his objection. But he needs premise two, there are enough different universes to get to the conclusion, therefore the fine tuning does not justify design inference. It's not enough for him to just say, well, maybe this. That's not sufficient as an objection to an inference from known data to say, maybe, if there were, because uh, he actually needs to say premise two, and there are, and that undermines the, the inference. It's a bit like saying, um, look, if X big number of monkeys existed with enough typewriters and paper and time on their hands, then they could type the plays of um, Henrik Ibsen. You can, you can see I do this work in Norway. Uh, of Henrik Ibsen by chance, right? If there were enough could in theory, but anyone faced with the many monkeys hypothesis as an actual explanation for the existence of the plays of Ibsen will ask, any, anyone faced, so if a big enough number of monkeys with typewriters existed, they could in theory type the plays of Ibsen by chance, randomly. Anyone faced with this many monkeys explanation as a proposed explanation for the existence of the specified complexity of Ibsen's plays. They're going to ask, is there any independent reason to believe in the existence of X number of monkeys and typewriters with time on their hands, randomly typing away? Because if not, they'll quite rationally favor the one author hypothesis rather than the many monkeys hypothesis. So if you say, look at this book, it's specified complex information. It probably was written by someone. It's not enough to say, oh yeah, but if there were enough monkeys with typewriters, therefore your argument doesn't work. That just that doesn't cut the mustard, as the English say. So theoretical physicist Brian Greene says people should be skeptical of multiverse theories because there's no evidence supporting their existence. Five, insufficient to explain away the data. Um, even if a multiverse did exist, what guarantees it would be big enough and varied enough to explain away the high degree of fine tuning seen in our universe? So philosopher of science Bruce Gordon says, there are many independent constants and factors that are fine tuned to a high degree of precision. The cumulative effect of all these fine tunings significantly erodes the probabilistic resources of, say, the string landscape in a, in a string theory, multiverse, universe theory. It's question begging. Um, as the agnostic cosmologist Paul Davis points out in his, uh, his book here, The Goldilocks Enigma, you know, why is the universe just right for life, like the porridge being just right, not too hot, not too cold, uh, he says, multiverse theories merely shift the problem up a level from universe to multiverse. He says, the same problem of, of explanation reoccurs. He says, there's, 
has to be a finely tuned, basically, universe generating mechanism to guarantee that you get lots of different universes, different universes of a kind that at least can include the parameters that are needed by life, rather than lots of different universes, none of which could include the parameters needed by life. <laughs> okay? There's still fine-tuning involved. The multiverse theory cannot provide a complete and final explanation of why the universe is fit for life, because it just raises the question of why does that multiverse universe producer why is that the kind of thing that produces a multiverse which could include a universe that's fit for life? It has to be fine-tuned to do that. Stephen C. Meyer argues that not only does the universe generating mechanism in inflationary cosmology require prior unexplained fine-tuning, it actually requires more fine-tuning than it was proposed to explain. And he goes into that in some detail in his recent book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. Uh, seven, uh, might, this idea might undermine the practice of science. Going back to Brian Greene, he points out the danger if the multiverse idea takes root it is that researchers may too quickly give up the search for un underlying explanations for things. It says, when faced with seemingly inexplicable observations, researchers may invoke the framework of the multiverse prematurely. Proclaiming that some phenomena or other is uh, merely reflects conditions in our own bubble universe, and thereby failing to discover the deeper understanding that awaits us. In other words, you see something really odd, you say, that seems strange and unlikely. What explains it? Oh, well, you know, strange stuff is bound to happen in the multiverse, you know. All sorts of randomly strange things are going to happen. So that's probably why it's just random and then not dig further <laughs> because, you, because, well, everything's in a multiverse and something, something will happen everywhere. Actually, if it's an infinite multiverse, everything will happen infinitely many times everywhere. Kind of. Eighth of the idea that the multiverse is disconfirmed. So astrophysicist Rodney Hodner again points out and argues that, that our universe is far more special than we would expect it to be even if it were merely a random member of the subset of universes compatible with our existence. So it says, you know, on the idea that there's a multiverse, and so some of those universes by chance are going to hit the pattern for life-bearing. Actually, our universe kind of is overly special. It doesn't just hit the pattern for, like, just about compatible with life. It's like, really fruitful for life. It doesn't it just hit the pattern for it has stable order in it. It hits the pattern for it has huge amounts of long-lasting stable order in it. And if the explanation for why do we observe life and order here is that, well, we, we just happen to be a random member of one of those universes in the multiverse that's compatible with life, you would expect us to observe a universe that is less special, less ordered, less fruitful, although still ordered and fruitful, than the one that we see. And so the fact that we see so much order and fruitfulness actually disconfirms the multiverse hypothesis. Um, atheist Roger Penrose puts it this way. He says, Consider how ridiculously cheaper, in the sense of improbabilities, it would be to simply produce by mere random collisions of particles, say, the entire solar system with all of its life ready-made, or even just a few conscious brains, so-called Boltzmann brains, the random collisions of, of, of particles just happening to produce a, a, a brain that's thinking. <laughs> Um, out of the chaos. That, that would be cheaper in the sense of improbable, less improbable. He says, the problem is, why did we not come about that way, this way, rather than from an absurdly less probable 1.4 times 10 to the 10 tedious years of evolution, of, of change over time in an ordered, structured, big ordered, structured, over long times universe. It seems to me that this conundrum simply points to the incorrectness of the bubble universe, the multiverse idea. 
theor theoretical physicist, uh, astrophysicist, and cosmologist Luke Barnes, who we quoted from earlier, goes into this Boltzmann brain issue. And he says, Boltzmann brains, Boltzmann was a, a, a scientist from, uh, I think, 19th or early 20th century. Uh, he says, Boltzmann brains do not need much fine tuning because they form by means of freak quantum fluctuations. Uh, if small regions of order are more likely than large regions, then Boltzmann brains are vastly more common than observers in large, low entropy universes like ours. So if we're a random member of the multiverse, you would expect to see that we are Boltzmann brains, but we're not. Um, if only very special uh, multiverses avoid this problem, then the multiverse itself is fine-tuned and thus question-begging. So there's a kind of dialectic between um, this objection and, and the question-begging uh, objection. And indeed, Barnes says, the problem's not that we, mu that we might be Boltzmann brains. This is kind of a side road that you know, philosophy 101 lectures might go down. Are you a brain in a vat? Um, the problem is that we aren't. We're taking as read the observation that, no, we're in this, this big, highly fruitful, ordered universe, compatible with, with life over long periods of time and so on. Um, but if we were a random member of a multiverse um, that had some life-permitting conditions in it that happened by chance, we would probably be observing something like we're Boltzmann brains, or not just an area of life fruitfulness the size of the solar system as... as um, Roger Penrose uh, was pointing out. Now, uh, the danger that the multiverse hypothesis undermines science may be mitigated, reduced, by the assumption that we are generic members of the multiverse, but this assumption also underwrites the problem of observational disconfirmation. So the undermined science and the observational disconfirmation problems also they form the horns of a dilemma for the multiverse hypothesis. So I think in light of the cumulative case, the accumulation of problems against the, the many universes objection does not constitute a sound uh, defeater to premise one of the cosmic uh, fine-tuning argument, uh, and thus um, on those considerations thus far, the argument goes through, but of course... Uh, it's a much debated and discussed field. It's one of the most discussed kind of um, arguments in the, the overlap between natural theology, arguments for God, and science uh, these days. Um, so there's lots of discussion around all sorts of issues, but that at least dips our toe into um, the introduction to the main, main way of, a main way of structuring the argument at least, and the main uh, objection that people um, give to that argument. Moreover, even if we were to grant the existence of a multiverse, philosopher Michael Rota makes a very interesting point when he says, our evidence supports a designer whether or not we're in a multiverse because a theistic multiverse, may, you say maybe God created lots of universes, right? You could do that. A theistic multiverse is a possibility and a theistic multiverse would likely contain a higher proportion, at least, of life-permitting universes than would an atheistic multiverse. On, on which assumption, the assumption that there is or isn't a god, would you predict that the number of life-permitting universes would be higher or lower? And he says you, you would predict, if, on the assumption that there's a god behind the multiverse, you'd, you'd predict that you'd see more life-permitting universes because that's the kind of thing that a, a designing mind might well be interested in producing. Um, thus, our relevant evidence, argues Roto, is more to be expected on a theistic multiverse hypothesis than on an atheistic multiverse hypothesis. So this is a kind of, okay, I don't think multiverse is a good idea, but even if we are prepared to grant it, uh, that doesn't necessarily end the, the argument here. And again, a range of books at, at different levels of this. Um, Bill Craig's On Guard for Students is a good uh, introductory kind of level uh, book that's got a good chapter on fine tuning. Uh, I discuss it in my recent reply to Richard Dawkins did a book recently called Outgrowing God, and I did a response that's in the form of a dialogue between students in a university reading group who happened to be reading Dawkins's book. 
and they're going through it and discussing it. And you know, in classic dialogue form, different different students represent different positions. So you've got a theist and two different kinds of atheists and an agnostic and they're kind of discussing the book, and there's a, a chapter in there that I talk a lot about fine-tuning in. Uh, Rodney Holder's introductory level book, Big Bang, Big God, covers a lot of this cosmological stuff well. Agnostic perspective from Paul Davis uh, from the Goldilocks Enigma. Uh, Paul Mayer's recent book on the return of the God hypothesis. He, he, he's one of the guys that uses this specified complexity way of putting the argument. There are other ways of, of putting it using probability theory and so on. Um, and he's, he's done a lot on this recently uh, about this, the fine tuning of the multiverse producing mechanisms and things, uh, which I thought was really fascinating stuff. Um, there's been a two, two part book, volumes one and two, uh, edited by Paul Copan on the clam cosmological argument. Um, and one looks at the philosophical arguments against an infinite past, and one looks at the cosmological data about is there a finite past or not. And so there's one on the science there. Luke Barnes, in a discussion uh, with Geraint Lewis, who doesn't believe in God, so as a theist and a non-theist, jointly writing a book on fine-tuning together. And that's, again, another place to go to for the fine-tuning is agreed. What's disagreed about is how we explain it, what the best explanation is. Um, Rodney Holder at a higher level of abstraction on God, the multiverse, and everything. And there's some interesting relevant chapters in... Um, a new theist response to the to new atheists.